He is not simply saying that God loves. That is true, but that's not what John is saying. No, John is telling us that love is the very essence of God's moral nature. He is telling us that God himself is love and that love is not just one of his attributes, but that love is who he is. God defines what true love is and he is the source of all true love. Like true LeCronc, I have a burden to tell you that God is indeed love and that he does love you. But what exactly does that mean? You know there's just as much confusion about love as there is about the nature of God. Recently a group of children were asked, what does love mean? Rebecca, eight years old, said, when my grandmother got arthritis, she couldn't bend over and paint her toenails anymore. So my grandfather does it for her all the time, even when his hands got arthritis too. That's love, she said. I read that to my wife and said, don't even think about it. <laughs> hmm. Billy, four years old, said, when someone loves you, the way they say your name is different. You just know that your name is safe in their mouth. <laughs> Bobby is seven. He said, love is what's in the room at Christmas if you stop opening your presents and listen. Nikki, who's six, said, if you want to learn to love better, you should start with somebody you hate. <laughs> Tommy, who was six, said, love is like a little old woman and a little old man who are still friends even after they know each other so well. And Cindy said, during my piano recital, I was on stage and I was so scared. And I looked at all the people watching me and I saw my daddy waving and smiling. He was the only one doing that and I wasn't scared anymore and that's love. Now there's a little truth in all of those statements. They're kind of interesting, a bit humorous. But it is important that you begin to understand what love is if you're going to understand what it means that God is love. And God's love is so different than what we view love to be in our culture today. When we open the pages of the Bible and begin to read about the love of God, we're looking at a multifaceted diamond. You see love in a way that you never dreamed it could even be described. In fact, this is such a vast subject. This is such a wide endeavor. How could any human being ever write anything meaningful about the love of God? And then I remembered as I was growing up, a song that George Beverly Shea used to sing in all of the Billy Graham Crusades. And the words to that song go like this. Could we with ink the ocean fill and were the skies of parchment made? Were every stock on earth a quill and every man a scribe by trade? To write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. The love of God is a vast subject, far beyond any human ability to comprehend it. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't try to learn all about it that we can. So for these next few moments, I want to tell you some things I've learned about the love of God. Some of the things you may know already, but some may come as a surprise to you. First of all, the Bible teaches us that God's love is uncaused. It's uncaused. The world today says, I love you if you are good looking, intelligent, and wealthy. I love you if you have a good education, a good job, and good connections. I love you if you produce much and sell much and buy much. There are so many ifs hidden in the world's love. These ifs enslave us since it's impossible to adequately meet up to them. So the world's love is and always will be conditional. But God's love is not like that. God does not love you because of anything in you. In our human relationships, we love another person because we see something in that person that attracts our love. But God's love for us is uncaused. It's unprompted. It's uninfluenced. It's free. It's spontaneous. There is nothing we can do to cause God to love us, and there is nothing we can do to prevent him from loving us. God loves us because he has chosen to love us and he loves us because that's all he can do. God is love. 
Nothing you will ever do could make God love you more than he loves you right now. Not greater achievement, not greater beauty, not wider recognition, not even greater levels of spirituality and obedience. Nothing you have ever done could make God love you any less. Not any sin, not any failure, not any guilt, not any regret. God loves you. He always has and he always will. When he wrote his letter to the Ephesians, Paul said it this way, God's love for us is according to the good pleasure of his will. Why does he love us? Because he chooses to. Brennan Manning once asked about the most important things he had learned about God's love, and he responded this way. He said, as a man, I love the Jersey Shore. I love Handel's Messiah, Hot Fudge, and my wife, Rosalind. I love what I find congenial or appealing. I love someone for what I find in him or her. But God is not like that. The God and Father of Jesus loves men and women not for what he finds in them, but for what he finds in them of himself. It is not because man and woman are good that he loves them. It is because he is so unspeakably, unimaginably good that he loves men and women even in their sin. It is not that he detects what is congenial and appealing and he responds to us with favor. He is the source of love. He acts, he does not react. He is love without motive. God's love is uncaused. Maybe you're among those who grew up thinking that you had to do so many good things for God to love you. And if you didn't, he wouldn't. Maybe you grew up in a family where you were on that kind of a performance basis. Maybe you heard your mother say when you were growing up, honey, if you don't do this, mommy won't love you anymore. But you need to put all that behind you if you want to know the love of God because love from God is uncaused love. It comes from him. It has nothing to do with you. Not only is his love uncaused, but as you study the Bible, you begin to realize it's also very unreasonable. God's love is unreasonable. From the beginning of the Garden of Eden, There was no cause or no reason from a human perspective for God to love Adam and Eve. There was no reason for him to cover their sins with the skin of a sacrificed animal. Nor was there a reason for God to spare Noah and his sons and their wives. There was no reason. Had any human being been in God's place, he would have shouted, enough! Sooner rather than later. There were countless reasons for God to have lowered the curtain on the human drama, but there were no reasons, humanly speaking, for him to press on in spite of the predictable failings of all of us. Because of this, we say that God's love is unreasonable. And Paul, writing to the Romans, put it this way, for when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's exactly what he did. He died for you and for me, all of us card-carrying sinners and enemies of God, yet it was in that situation that love manifested itself, a wholly unreasonable act of a righteous man dying in the place of unrighteous men. God's love is uncaused and it's unreasonable. And it's unending. God's love is unending. The Bible says that God is love and the Bible also says that God is eternal. So if God is love and God is eternal, then God's love has to be eternal. He's the everlasting God. He's the Alpha and Omega. He's the beginning and the end. He is the one who is and who was and who is to come. He's the Almighty. We all divide time into past, present, and future, but God doesn't live in those categories. God's name is I am, not I was or I will be. I am. He inhabits eternity. He's the King Eternal. Of him the psalmist wrote, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Now since God is eternal and God is love, his love is eternal. And that means that the love he will have for us in the future will never be greater than his love for us now. And his love for us now is not greater than it has been in the past. 
He loves us with an everlasting, eternal love. And the prophet Jeremiah put it this way, the Lord has appeared of old to me saying, yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love, therefore with loving kindness I have drawn you. How awesome to know that before the worlds were created, God set his love upon you, upon me. Before we had any being, God loved us. In a couple of chapters of this book that I have written, I deal with that subject. There's a chapter called, God loved you before you were born. It's the answer to all of this question about abortion and when does life begin? The Bible says that life begins at conception and from the very beginning and long before the beginning, God set his love upon us. And J.I. Packer, J.I. Packer in his classic Knowing God said, what matters supremely is not the fact that I know God, but the larger fact which underlies it, that he knows me. I am graven on the palms of his hands. I'm never out of his mind. All my knowledge of him depends on his sustained initiative in knowing me. I know him because he first knew me and he continues to know me. He knows me as a friend. He knows me as one who loves me. And there is no moment in my life when his eye is off of me or his attention is distracted from me. And no moment, therefore, when his care falters. He loves me and is constantly taking knowledge of me in his love. God's love is uncaused. You can't make him love you because he already does. God's love is unreasonable. It doesn't make any sense, but it's true. God's love is unending. There's nothing you can do to keep him from continuing to love you. He's loved you from the beginning, and he'll love you all the way to the end. And the Bible teaches that God's love is unlimited. Somebody has said that God's center is everywhere, and his circumference is nowhere. God fills the heavens and the earth with his presence. Behold, says the scripture, heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain you. And Paul acknowledges that God is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and we move and we have our being. Where God is, love is. Allow me to illustrate this wonderful truth by changing a couple of words in a very familiar psalm. We all know about Psalm 139 and how it talks about the omnipresence of the Lord. But I've just changed one word so you can get the point tonight. Here's what it says. Oh God, where can I go from your love? Or where can I flee from your love? If I ascend to heaven, your love is there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, your love is there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your love shall lead me and your love shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light around me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide me from your love. Where do you go to get away from God's love? There isn't any place you can go because God is love and God is everywhere. I have met people, I'm sure you have too, who believe that they have pushed God's love beyond its borders. God couldn't love me anymore after what I've done. How many times have you said this in your own heart, whether you want to say it out loud or not? How many times have you allowed yourself to think this thought? But our human experience has taught us there's a limit to love, and we often put God in that box. But God doesn't live in that box. And as we often do, we create God in our own image, thinking that he has limits like we have limits. But I'm here to tell you tonight that God's love is unlimited. He cannot be bound in any of the structures that we know. He is God who is everywhere, therefore his love is everywhere. No matter where you go, you can't get away from it. He is always going to be there in his love. And his love is unchanging. In a world that moves and changes so fast that it's almost impossible to keep up with it, here is one of the characteristics of Almighty God that we need to remember. Malachi 3, 6 says it this way, For I am the Lord, and I do not change. Psalm 33, 11 says, The counsel of the Lord stands forever, the plans of his heart to all generations. 
Psalm 102 says, but you are the same, and your years shall have no end. What a wonderful thought to know that because God is unchanging, his love is unchanging, his love is constant in its faithfulness and continual in its expression. Here's a way to understand that. I read this when I was reworking this one day. I, I ran across this. Sometimes we joke and we say about marriage, the honeymoon is over. But that's because we are finite. That's because we can't sustain a honeymoon level of intensity and affection. We can't foresee the irritations that come with long-term familiarity. Can I get a witness? We can't stay as fit and handsome as we once were. We can't come up with enough new things to keep the relationship that fresh. But God says his joy over us, his people, is like a bridegroom over a bride. He is talking about honeymoon intensity and honeymoon pleasure and honeymoon energy and excitement and enthusiasm and enjoyment. He is trying to get into our hearts what he means when he says he rejoices over us with all of his heart and adds this to it, that with God, the honeymoon never ends. He's infinite in power and wisdom and creativity and love. Now watch this. He has no trouble sustaining a honeymoon level of intensity. He can foresee all the future quirks of our personality and has decided he will keep what's good and change what isn't. He will always be as handsome as he ever was. <laughs> and he will see that we get more and more beautiful forever. And he infinitely, creatively thinks of new things to do together with us so that there will never be any boredom for the next trillion years of eternity. God is on a honeymoon with you and me. His love never changes. It's always the same. One of the problems that we have in our culture is that people say things like this. Why are you leaving? Well, I just don't love her anymore. I often have a problem with that because love is not something we have emotionally. Love is a command. God says, husbands, love your wives. Well, I don't feel like loving her. It doesn't make any difference. Love her anyway. That's what the Bible says. If you love her anyway, pretty soon you'll feel like loving her. Right? Toward the end of his earthly ministry, the love of Christ was tested. Do you remember this? Through a period of deep disappointment because of the unfaithfulness of his disciples, Thomas doubted him. Peter denied him three times. Judas betrayed him into the hands of his enemies. When he needed them to watch and pray with him and for him, they fell asleep instead. While he was beginning to agonize over the cross and its implications, they were in a room arguing over which one of them would be the greatest in the future kingdom. Have you ever read what the scripture says about this? Listen to this. In the midst of all of this, not only did Jesus humble himself as a servant and wash their feet, but he continued to love them. I remember the day I read this with astonishment. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end end through all of their disloyalty through all of their betrayal through all of the things they did to break his heart he never stopped loving them for one moment jesus love for his disciples was unchanged even by their betrayal and their abandonment did you know there's a good side and a better side to god's unchanging love the good side is that god won't wake up in the morning and decide he's had enough of us The better side is that even when we wake up in the morning and decide we've had enough of him, he will still love us. When the Bible tells us that God's love is unlimited, I think it means that God's love is something like the love of a mother. Perhaps a mother like this mother in a story that I read told by Michael Brown. He said, a friend told me about a boy who was the apple of his parents' eyes. Tragically, in his mid-teens, the boy's life went astray. He dropped out of school. He began associating with a bad crowd. One night, he staggered into his house at 3 a.m., completely drunk. His mother slipped out of bed and left her room. 
The father followed, assuming that his wife was in the kitchen, perhaps crying, as had been so often the case. Instead, he found her at her son's bedside, softly stroking his matted hair as he lay passed out drunk on the covers. What in the world are you doing, honey, the father said. And the mother answered, he won't let me love him when he's awake, so I have to love him when he's asleep. And I'm here to tell you, God loves us. When we're awake, when we're asleep, no matter what condition we're in, he never stops loving us. His love is uncaused. It's unreasonable. It's unending. It's unlimited. It's unchanging. Let me tell you something else. It's uncomplicated. It's uncomplicated. Karl Barth was Switzerland's greatest 20th century theologian. He accomplished some great things as a theologian. He wrote 13 volumes of church dogmatics, a theological work containing more than six million words. When Barth made his only trip to the United States in 1962, he was supposedly asked by a student to summarize the millions of words about the Bible and theology that he had written. While his audience awaited to be amazed by a profound statement from this theologian, he said, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Do you know what the message of God's Word is? Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. So God's love is uncomplicated. The question then becomes, who does God love? If God is love, who does he love? Well, the Bible tells us that he loves his own son. Doesn't that make sense? On two occasions, the Bible tells us that God expressed his love for his own son. At Jesus' baptism and at his transfiguration, from the heavens were these words, these words of God's love for his child this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. The first thing we know when we study the love of God in the Bible is that God loves His Son. We also know, and this should be not a surprise to most of us here, that God dearly loves Israel. Did you know the Bible tells us that? And we're reminded when we were there how desperately these people need to know of the love of God but also of the love of this nation. The Bible says that God loved Israel so much that he used a metaphor to describe it. He said that as long as the sun and the moon and the stars shine in the heavens, as long as the heavens remain immeasurable and the earth's foundations are undiscoverable, as long as that happens, God would continue to love Israel. God said, before I stop loving Israel, you've got to pull the moon and the stars out of the sky. You've got to destroy the heavens. You've got to destroy the undiscoverable earth before God will stop loving Israel. There are many today who teach that God does not have a plan for Israel today. I do not want to argue with you about it except to ask you to carefully read the Scripture because the Bible tells us that God loves Israel and he has a plan for them. And it is in our best interest as a nation to remember that those who bless Israel, God will bless. And those who curse Israel, God will curse. And then let me tell you the third thing. We're, we're coming down to the end of this. Let me tell you the third thing. God loves those who believe in Christ. God has a special love for those who believe in his son. In fact, in John 17, 23, we read these words, that the world may know that you, God, have loved them 
as you have loved me. Jesus said, God, you love Christians the same way that you love me. In his letter to the Colossians, Paul said of Christ's followers that they were the elect of God, holy and loved. God loves his son. God loves Israel. God loves all those who love him. But how many of you know the most important thing for us to remember is that God loves the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He loves the world. He doesn't love the physical world, the earth and the sky. That's not what that means. He loves the world of humanity. The Bible says in Romans 5, 8 that God commends his love toward us, that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. This world that God's love is a world that was ruined by man's sin. Yet it is this world without strength and weak and sinners that God loves. It is God's love that is the motivating force behind our salvation. Listen to these words from Ephesians. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, for by grace you are saved. God loves his son. God loves Israel. God loves those who believe in Christ. God loves the world. But most important of all, God loves you. He loves you. God does not love populations. He loves people. He does not love masses. He loves men. He loves us all with a mighty love that has no beginning and can have no end. Are you aware of how much God loves you? A young girl who we know who's very, very successful in the entertainment business sent me a note, and in the note she said, you know, nobody would ever believe this because I'm so confident in front of everyone and and, uh, won awards and all this sort of thing. But she said, I have such a hard time believing that God really loves me. And I'm always trying to figure out a way to make him love me because I don't feel his love. And you know, a lot of times that's true. If we grow up in a family where we don't have the love of our fathers, sometimes we just transfer that over to our heavenly father. We think our heavenly father's like our earthly father. And she was reminding me of something that I've run into throughout all the four decades that I've been preaching the gospel. One of the most important things for us to know in our hearts is this, you are loved by the Father. He loves you. He loves you more than you could ever know, more than I can ever express to you. Edward Farrell was a priest from Detroit who took a two-week summer vacation to Ireland to celebrate his favorite uncle's 80th birthday. On the morning of the great day, Ed and his uncle got up before dawn and dressed in silence and went for a long, long walk along the shores of Lake Killarney. Just as the sun rose, his uncle turned and stared straight into the rising sun. Ed stood beside him for 20 minutes with not a single word exchanged. Then the elderly uncle began to dance along the shoreline with a radiant smile on his face. After catching up with him, Ed said, Uncle Seamus, you look very happy. Do you want to tell me why? 